is under arrest tonight. The 34 year old was taken into custody at his home in San Diego last night. Court documents say he targeted older women and raped them. There are five different cases and the victims range in ages from 54 to 86 years old. Yeah, that's right. And right off the top, I want to mention Virginia a typo on my part in racing to get that script in. It's Winslow, not Williams, but uh, that's how I typed it in and I apologize for that. But in any case, yeah, she confronted him, you know, a strange man to her. She wanted to know what he was doing in her neighbor's apartment. And she says what he told her, she didn't believe for a second. I looked and it was this big black Hummer truck with the Thule rack. And I went, why is this at my house? It was about 2 p.m. Thursday when a resident of the Park and Sanitas mobile homes who asked not to be identified heard the sound of a loud vehicle outside her home. He pulled in front of my driveway, parked in front of my window, which was open. And the sound of the truck was so loud that, you know, I thought it was a delivery. It turned out it was a large Hummer SUV that she photographed. The man inside, now identified by the San Diego County Sheriff's Department as Kellen Winslow Jr. He headed into her neighbor's home, likely through an open sliding glass door. So I could see through my blinds, I saw his feet, white shoes and white socks. She says he wore shorts and a t-shirt like athletic wear and was in the home for about 10 minutes before coming out. I confronted him and I said, hi, can I help you with anything? And he said, nope, just looking for my dog. I go, what dog? And he said, well, it's a red dog, Clifford. You know, and I went, there's no dog here. I said, I'm not comfortable with this, you need to leave. And he just stood there and he just went, all right then. The woman says the man's demeanor was calm the entire time. One of her neighbors, a married couple in their 80s, was home at the time and never knew Kellen was inside. I don't think they realize the severity of everything. And another bizarre aspect to this is that the neighbor, or I should say Kellen, inside the home at some point took off his t-shirt. When he came out, he was carrying his t-shirt. He didn't appear to be carrying anything else. The sheriff's deputies did catch up with him about a half mile from here where the arrest was made. His attorney emphatically denying that he broke into anyone's home. He made over $40 million in his NFL career and has no need to steal anything from anybody. Kellen Winslow Jr. played 10 years in the NFL, a tight end on five teams. The Cleveland Browns, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Seattle Seahawks, New England Patriots, and New York Jets. Those days ended five years ago. A good career for the one-time standout for the Scripps Ranch High School Falcons. Thursday, he was arrested on suspicion of burglary, booked into county jail in Vista, then released on bail, Damn. saying nothing as a photographer stood outside with his camera. Vista, Mary, good afternoon. Jason, Virginia, I, as I was leaving court, one of his alleged victims was testifying about what happened to her one day back in May. She testified she did not get a good look at the man's face, but charging documents say Kellen Winslow Jr. is the man who exposed himself to her that day while she was gardening in Cardiff by the Sea. There was another woman, though, who took the stand first today, one of his alleged burglary victims who says Winslow Jr. was standing inside of her home one day last month, but that she didn't feel threatened. Uh, I, I never got any feeling of fear or that he was there to harm me in any way. Sheriff's deputies who pulled Winslow over after the burglary incidents also took the stand. Those were the first charges on which Winslow Jr. was arrested and bailed out. Then his PR person saying this was all a misunderstanding. And Winslow's wife, we learned, even took chocolates to one of those alleged burglary victims as an apology. But within a week, Winslow was arrested again. This time, deputies connecting him to two rape and kidnapping incidents involving two transient women in their 50s who say he raped them and then threatened to kill them if either reported him. Prosecutors also painting a much darker picture of Winslow Jr.'s burglary charges, saying that he intended to rape his elderly victims. As his he, son faced the judge. He was, and uh, denial, yes, of course, that's, it's an arraignment you must plead not guilty. That's exactly what happened here today. 
uh, Keller Winslow II, uh, charged with uh, eight felony counts, including uh, five victims. And the DA says there may be more out there. If there are, he wants them to come forward. We uh, have video of Winslow in court as he stood shackled as the uh, prosecutor detailed the charges against him. This includes two forcible rapes within his uh, vehicle, a Hummer. Uh, there was also a charge of indecent exposure and then a fourth and fifth residential burglary with intent to commit rape. These cases all involved, as you said, older women ages 54 up to 86. Now, two of the women were transients and uh, the DA says that uh, uh, they were threatened as well. Now, uh, Kellen Winslow Sr., who was a superstar with the San Diego Chargers years ago, in court today. Accused of touching himself in front of a 77-year-old woman at a Carlsbad gym. And good evening. I'm Steve Atkinson. And I'm Lindsay Pena. Winslow is already awaiting trial for kidnapping and rape. 10 News reporter Vanessa Van Hefti is live at the gym with these new allegations. Vanessa. Yeah, we do want to warn you, some of the details of this case may be a bit graphic. Prosecutors today alleging that Winslow was in the crunch fitness here in Carlsbad when he fondled himself in front of a 77-year-old woman, and they say it wasn't the first time. Uh, Kellen Winslow Jr., a once shining star in the NFL, faces the possibility of life behind bars. Prosecutors say while out on bail just two weeks ago, Winslow approached a 77-year-old woman here at Crunch Fitness in the jacuzzi, wearing only a towel. And he then, as she stated, unmistakably began masturbating only a few feet away from me. Police say it didn't stop there. He reached out, touching her arm and foot as she tried to get away. Nine days earlier, he allegedly approached that same woman. He appeared to be erect. He asked her if he if she wanted if she saw that and if she liked that. Also in January, Winslow allegedly contacted an 18 year old high school student and he commented that he had seen her in the area the last couple of days. He told her that he thought that she was cute. Her parents reported it to police. No charges were filed. The former NFL player was on house arrest with a GPS monitor free on a $2 million bail when these recent allegations surfaced, awaiting trial on felony charges of kidnapping and raping two homeless women in their 50s in Encinitas, and then raping a 17-year-old unconscious girl when he was just 19. The judge this time around denying bail. That Kellen Winslow took what he wanted. He victimized five women. The pain that she felt was so tremendous that she said she felt herself begin to bleed. The defendant grabbed her neck with both his hands and choked her and told her, if you scream, I will kill you. She finally said back to him, if you don't hurt me, I won't scream. So he released her neck. You're going to hear that she does not want to come to court because she's so afraid. And there was a point where the defendant then, now with a fully erect penis, stood within feet of her and began to thrust his hips forward as though he was stretching in some way. And he asked her, with his erect penis directly in front of her, do you see that? Do you like that? And she just said, what did you say to me? And he turned, almost as though he was startled she would react in that way and walked away. There's been infidelity in his relationship. Kellen's not proud of it, but he's never denied it. There was sex. No strings attached sex. On cough syrup. And that's, your, that's what you told the police, right? That you were on cough syrup. Exactly. Okay. And you remember, you pointed out this man. Right. Being the individual who raped you. Remember that? Yes. This man I'm standing in front of. Yes. For the record, this is Mr. Watkins. The record will still reflect. And that's still the person who raped you? No, it's the one next to you. I was terrified. Yes, I thought right. he was a terrorist. You didn't? Oh, he's a terrorist. Well, Objection argumentative. When this rapist terrorist left, you didn't pick up your phone and go 911, did you? No. Did you imply that you needed money for shopping for sex? No, I begged him to let me go, and he, 
and he, he said, I will after this is done, so. Did you say bring it on? I said bring it on so we can get this, so I can get out of here. That day, I can't really remember. I mean, as much as what I told you is all I know. Um, he's offered me food, he's offered me lunch, offered me $25, and I said no to all that. And then he said something. I don't know how he said it or how he presented it, but, you know, you know, he just it didn't seem like him. You know, it seemed like the opposite of what he was shown himself, you know, $50, you know, for, you know, sex. And I said, I'm not that kind of person. Can you tell us why, at that point in time, why you didn't plan to tell anybody? I was, because he said he's going to murder me. And I was, I don't want anybody else to get hurt. I was afraid if I told anybody, they'd get hurt. I was afraid of him coming back. And um, I was afraid of getting attacked. Do you recall you received a, you received a gift certificate to Target for two hundred dollars? You got that right. That was when it was right before court. Before that, I didn't get anything. Did you report this crime by the person you knew as Kevin because you thought the district attorney's office might put you in a motel? No, I didn't know that. I don't know how. I didn't know how the courtroom worked. Is there a habit or custom in Vietnamese culture to not look at strangers directly in the face? Có phải là cái thói quen hay là cái phong tục của người Việt Nam là mình không nhìn người lạ thẳng vô trong mặt hay không? Đúng. Yes, that is correct. Is that part of the reason why you did not look at the man in the face? Có phải đó là một phần lý do tại sao mà chị không nhìn thẳng vô mặt ông ta hay không? Đúng. Yes, that is correct. Did he touch himself? Ông ta có dùng cái tay để đụng vào đó hay không? Yes, he used his hand to uh, hold the penis. What did you do when the man took his pants off and showed you his penis? Chị đã làm gì khi ông ta cởi cái quần ra và ông ta cho chị thấy cái dương vật của ông ta? Thì tôi lúc đó tôi tôi at that moment, I said, no, 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 and then I walked away. He did not take off his pen completely. He just took off his pen to the point that I can saw. Winslow admitted to cheating on his wife numerous times, admitting to having sex with a homeless woman and a hitchhiker, but he says the sex was consensual and he's not a rapist. First round draft pick Kellen Winslow Jr., son of the San Diego Chargers Hall of Famer, was once the highest paid tight end in football, earning $40 million in the NFL. And I ask you to judge him by his deeds, not who he is, not who his father is. Prosecutors say the married father was given fame and fortune, but it wasn't enough. He took what he wanted. He faces 12 counts, rape, kidnapping, lewd conduct, and indecent exposure. He victimized five women, five separate women. The first accuser, 17 at the time, raped, she says, unconscious. A search warrant was conducted on his residence. Silent and emotionless, Kellen Winslow II quietly listened to the prosecutor list out details of his new charges. Kidnapping and rape of two homeless women, one in March, the other in May. Prosecutors say the former NFL player reportedly found the hitchhikers in their 50s in Encinitas, lured them into his Hummer and raped them. Jane Doe's one and two uh, each indicated that uh, Mr. Winslow had threatened to kill them if they were to report uh, what had happened to them. Then, on March 24th, the DA says Winslow surprised and exposed himself to a 55-year-old woman who was gardening. The last two charges? Burglaries with intent to rape, both at this senior's only mobile home park off El Camino Real. The victims, a 71-year-old lady who on June 1st says she caught Winslow lurking around in her laundry room. And an 86-year-old woman who six days later says she saw Winslow come into her home while she was in bed. He was positively identified by the neighboring witness. Feelings amongst the residents at the mobile home park teeter both ways. Some claim the accusers knew Winslow, while others remain skeptical.
The Homeowners Association told 10 News, quote, We all watch out for each other and our next board meeting is next week, so I know it will be discussed. From our experience, it seems pretty unusual for a jury to return a partial verdict. Can you talk about the significance of that and whether it may be telling in any way? Sure. Good morning. The interesting part about what happened yesterday was not necessarily that the jury returned a partial verdict, meaning that they convicted Winslow of three of the four counts. They were able to unanimously come back and say, hey, we have a verdict. It was the way everything went about, how the court took the four verdicts and then sent them back to deliberate. So that was really the unique aspect of yesterday. And, and why is that? In other words, typically we're used to them coming out and it's, it's either done or it's a mistrial. Right. I think part of what happened is I think the jurors might have thrown the court for a little bit of a loop there when the judge asked, hey, would any further deliberation help? And at that point, usually everyone, everyone including myself and other legal analysts looking at the case were thinking, well, no. At that point, the judge would have declared a mistrial. But the foreperson, the juror that the judge asked those questions to, started saying, well, I don't know, it might. And that's what led Judge Bowman ultimately to ask the jury to go back and continue to deliberate on those remaining eight counts. How dramatically can this affect the time he spends in prison? Well, it is a gigantic difference in what could happen based on what he's facing now versus what could happen if he's convicted of any of the offenses related to Jane Doe 1 or Jane Doe 4. Right now, his maximum sentence, if he just gets sentenced on what he was convicted of, is nine years in state prison. If he gets convicted of any of the, I believe, three offenses with Jane Doe 1, any of the two offenses with Jane Doe 4, that would then trigger the multiple victim enhancement which means he'll be looking at at least 15 years to life, a straight indeterminate sentence where he could face the rest of his life in prison. If it's a hung jury on the rest of the counts, could he be retried just on those? Yeah, I think absolutely he will be. It's ultimately up to the judge and the district attorney. The judge has the power to dismiss any of the hung counts. The district attorney has the power to dismiss any of the hung counts. Given the fact where this case started, given what Mr. Winslow's exposure was and still is, if he's convicted of multiple counts and multiple victims, I would be shocked if either the judge or the district attorney dismisses the case. So I would expect a retrial uh, probably as soon as later this year. What do you think the perception is from the defense in terms of what the jury did? Well, I mean, you know, from the defense side of it, I would be concerned that they're still deliberating at this point out of fear that he, they're, they're probably really close to convicting him of one or multiple of those other counts. So the concern is, is that, okay, well, he was convicted of Jane Doe 2, which many people, myself included, thought was the most compelling alleged victim that came in and testified. So I don't think they're necessarily shocked by that, but they're certainly concerned that he has not been acquitted as it relates to Jane Doe 1 and Jane Doe 4 and this fact that he's still facing life going into today. Yes, Richard. And Barbara Lee and Marcella, this article published online by Sports Illustrated after Kellen Winslow's conviction on felony rape offers an unsettling look at Winslow's reported behavior while an NFL player. We should warn you that some viewers may find these graphic details disturbing. He has now been convicted of forcible rape. Well, the prosecution laid out its argument for why Kellen Winslow II should remain in custody pending his retrial in the near future. He is a convicted felon pending sentencing, which requires a mandatory term in state prison as well as lifetime sex offender registration. He does pose a significant danger to the community. This explosive article published online this week by Sports Illustrated delves into the former tight end's past during his time with the NFL. The in-depth report featured on SI.com outlined stories gleaned from Winslow's former teammates and coaches, highlighting his reportedly sexually deviant behavior. According to Sports Illustrated, Winslow developed a reputation among colleagues as a compulsive masturbator and pornography enthusiast. At one point, according to the report, a Browns equipment manager found him masturbating in his Hummer. While on team flights to out-of-town games, none of his teammates would want to sit next to him due to his ritual of watching hardcore pornography on his portable DVD player. Sports Illustrated also reports that Winslow would often watch porn on his smartphone during team meetings and on road trips would reportedly masturbate in his hotel room no matter who else was in the room at the time, leading to teammates requesting not to be assigned as his roommate. Perhaps most disturbing, according to the article, Winslow later in his NFL career began taking a silicone mold of an anatomically correct woman's torso with him on road trips. As one former coach told Sports Illustrated, comparing Winslow Winslow's past reported behavior to the current criminal case, quote, he showed the signs of being a perv, but clearly it has escalated. This is another level. Now, 
She wrote a book called Judging Winslow Jr. about the NFL star. Uh, you see the cover there. And uh, so, Elena, you know this case inside and out. What'd you think about this plea when you heard about it yesterday? Well, I think everybody in that courtroom was completely shocked. I mean, I was sitting in there, I was with all the media, and everybody just was so stunned. You just, I mean, there's the looks on those faces were just like, what is happening here? We were ready for those opening statements. We've been waiting. We had been sent out for two hours. We came back. Now we're ready for these opening statements. And then all of a sudden, Judge Bowman says that Helen Winslow wants to plead guilty. And I think that everybody just practically fell off their chair. It was very, very shocking. Wow, good insight into the uh, the atmosphere of the courtroom there. So when you heard that, what was going through your head? I mean, you've been covering this and you know this story so well. Um, what do you think about this deal? Well, you know, it makes sense when you really analyze the facts. It makes sense because both sides, I believe, had an uphill battle here, especially for the defense, because now they have the convictions from the first trial. You have the the conviction for the forcible rape of Jane Doe number two. You have the conviction for the um, indecent exposure to Jane Doe number three. Uh, the DA made the motion to bring those into the trial. Of course, the defense you know, fought that, but Judge Bowman granted it. Now the jury was going to be told about these convictions. And also because of the propensity law, they were going to be able to use that, those convictions and those actions in the underlying crimes to be able to find him guilty of the other crimes that he was charged with for the second trial. So that was huge. That's a devastating instruction. And, you know, it's, it's the law in California, but um, devastating for the defense. But the prosecution by no means had it easy either because they have Jane Doe number one and Jane Doe number four. Both of them have credibility issues. Jane Doe number one, as we remember from the first trial, basically got massacred by Mark Carlos on that cross-examination. She had the lies about the drinking, the, the questioning about the, the blood, you know, was she lying about it or was she, she was all over the map, whether this was blood or where she was on her, men, her menstruating. And then if you get beyond those lies and that credibility, then you get to her story. And her story was, we have to face it, was bizarre. And one detective even um, characterized it as, you know, he said it was like fanciful or far-fetched. It's hard to believe that you have uh, this rape that's going to occur in broad daylight. There's suspense. They climb the fence. Helen Winslow Jr. is on the opposite side of the fence. He takes his clothes off. He's buck naked. She's on the opposite side. She could run to freedom. She has her cell phone, but instead she climbs over the fence. And before that, she asks for her backpack because she wants her sunscreen. So is she really in fear for her life? Is she, is she going to be raped? She's going to be murdered. So you have all these problems with her testimony. And then Jane Doe number four, the uh, rape from 15 years ago, she, there's a lot of problems with her testimony too. She's told three different stories. She told the story she uh, that she testified to on that witness stand. She has a story that she told to Sergeant Emig when she called that hotline number. And then she has a story that was told to her boyfriend, Brandon Guillermo. So you have three different stories. You're asking a jury to determine what happened here. And at times it seems like she doesn't know if she's told these three different stories. And then on top of that, she also questioned to the district attorney, which is on tape during their discussions with her, that she's not sure that during this blackout time, if it was really a blackout time because of the alcohol or, for, or, or some other reason, or if it was just that she blocked it out. So was it a blackout or was it a blockout? And so maybe she did something. She's questioning this. Maybe I did something that caused this to happen. And if we remember that two weeks prior, she had consensual sex with Kellen Winslow. She talked about how she met him. They were flirting. They went upstairs and they had consensual sex. So did something like this happen again in the second encounter? And she's just blocked it out. And Mark Carlos, this time, the defense, was ready to bring in a memory expert to talk about, you know, that during that time period when somebody is, um, has blocked that out, they could still be doing things. They just don't remember it. So I think that there was a lot of, of um, issues that Dan Owens was going to have to address. You know, if we look back to that jury verdict, you have Jane Doe, number one. The jury had a, a big split, five to seven. Five people said, we can't vote guilty. And Jane Doe, number four, it was 10 to two. 
So there's problems. And then also, when you go back to Jane Doe number two, the homeless woman who he had befriended, they found him guilty of that rape in that first trial, but but they, they hung on the sodomy count. But then again, here's another problem for Dan Owens, is that we have Jane Doe number two on the witness stand saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's penetration. Might have been an accident. So you don't have that either. And so I think there was problems for both sides. They both had, I think, big battles and hurdles to overcome. And I think this was probably probably the best thing that could ever happen, really, for Kelly Winslow Jr. Because taking that chance of going into that into that trial, and if all they needed was one more forcible rape, forcible sodomy, and he's going to have a life sentence. They're out there to kill you. So I'm gonna kill them. You you write that in the paper. You write that. You make money off that. No man, I'm pissed. All y'all take this down. I'm pissed, man. We don't care about nobody except this you. We don't. If I didn't hurt him, he'd hurt me. They're gunning for my legs. I'm gonna come right back at him. Helmet on helmet hit. He was taken off the field with concussion. And now former NFL star Larry Johnson speaking out in an ABC News exclusive. Johnson's 38, convinced he's living with CTE as he battles memory loss, anxiety, and suicidal impulses. Lindsay Davis sat down with him, joins us now. Good morning, Lindsay. Good morning, George. He was a first round draft pick in 2003. And today, Larry Johnson says there are two entire NFL seasons he simply doesn't remember. He says he doesn't blame the NFL, but Johnson says it's time to change the way the game is played because he believes the game has changed him. He played the game with a rage that made him great. The catch and run into the 47. A 2002 Heisman Trophy finalist at Penn State and a two-time pro bowler. In 2006, playing for the Kansas City Chiefs, Larry Johnson carried the ball 416 times, an NFL record. Thank you for talking with us. But the 38-year-old former NFL running back now believes he suffers from CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Why do you believe you have CTE? I get light headaches every now and again, and my anxiety levels is off the charts. Sometimes I can't be in places certain long, so I have to retreat back to my own place because the anxiety makes my heart beat faster. Johnson is convinced his many symptoms, including erratic mood swings and forgetfulness, all point to CTE. But you've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, so why not attribute these feelings to that? Because those feelings don't have anything to do with my headaches. They don't have anything to do with why I'm sensitive to light, sensitive to noise. He also describes destructive impulses and, in some cases, actions. Johnson has been arrested six times, several times for assaulting women. In 2009, he was waived by the Chiefs after being suspended for conduct detrimental to the club. Rock bottom is almost losing custody of your daughter, not coming home at night, don't know where you are. It was kind of let life drag me along and hopefully somebody would put me out of my misery. A pattern of troubled behavior that he says is not all that unlike Aaron Hernandez, the former New England Patriot who committed suicide in his jail cell while serving a life sentence for murder and was recently found to have suffered the most severe case of CTE ever discovered in a person of his age. Dr. Ann McKee, who has not evaluated Johnson and is not his doctor, says while we can't diagnose CTE while someone is still alive, we can suspect CTE based on their symptoms and if they've been exposed to repetitive head trauma. It can be very difficult to dis distinguish between mental health issues and uh, CTE symptoms. And I would say in this particular situation, it's close to impossible. year old NFL player, and this is an 83-year-old player. Kevin Ellison wasn't the biggest or strongest football player at USC, but he was the ideal from 2005 through 2008. The smarts to earn an economics degree, the toughness to overcome three knee surgeries, the legendary work ethic, and of course, the ferocious hits. He played 13 games for the NFL's San Diego Chargers in 2009. The Chargers cut him after one season, his career faltered, 
and problems emerged in 2012 when he set his apartment on fire. He claimed God told him to do it. He cycled through jobs. He went on and off medication for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. He lived at his mother's house in Inglewood. Late one night in October 2018, a car hit and killed Kevin as he walked along the Interstate 5 freeway in the San Fernando Valley. A lot of space between these, these ventricles are gigantic. So no question, this is an impaired person. Just looking at the surface of the brain, you can't be sure that there's any abnormality. We'll have to cut into it. Oh, he, he has very large ventricles. That is a very large fourth ventricle, and also he's lost a lot of pigment laterally. It's starting to look like an impaired brain. CTE is a devastating neurodegenerative disease researchers believe is found in the brains of people who have experienced repeated head trauma. They could be victims of domestic violence, members of the military, or football players. The disease can only be definitively diagnosed after death. Researchers have found the disease in scores of deceased players. Many of the names are familiar. Junior Seau, Dwight Clark, Frank Gifford. Kevin's family wanted to help find answers. A few days after his death, they decided to donate his brain to be studied by researchers in Boston. It has a very distinct pathologic signature. Uh, it tends to affect certain parts of the brain. As it progresses throughout your life, it can cause problems with cognition, problems with mood, problems with behavior. And the number one thing is changes your personality. The process is the family calls our brain bank numbers. They will arrange for a local person to go out to the funeral home where the person uh, is and uh, have the brain and, and the spinal cord removed. And then uh, it's uh, air freighted to uh, our labs. Under the best of circumstances, it usually takes two months to process the brain. But because we have a backlog and we can't even get to it right away, that's that's wow. His ventricle is very large. Yeah, it's notched. Even his hippocampus and amygdala look too small. Ooh, so now we have a better chance to look at that membrane. First of all, it's really irregular. The corpus callosum is thin, but then this membrane should be that white and it should be nice and straight and it's all gelatinous and irregular. It's, it looks damaged. Then we make our routine blocks. We take our standard sections from uh, the 29 to 30 areas. It goes through a series of processing, gets uh, processed into wax. They'll be cut on a, a, on a microtome into extremely thin slices, and those thin slices will be stained with a variety of stains and immunostains. And then the, the ultimate result is uh, this box of slides. And we'll look through these, and this will form uh, the basis of the pathologic diagnosis. And that's done completely independently of what the clinicians are doing. And then all the families, they go through this kind of long, iterative uh, process where we gather a bunch of clinical information. We gather medical history, psychological history, uh, substance abuse history. We gather a uh, history of their cognitive, behavioral, and mood symptoms, what kind of symptoms they had. Uh, what was the course of those symptoms. And they do this through over-the-phone interviews. They do this through uh, online questionnaires. And they basically, in a sense, paint a picture of what this patient had. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in a sense, they come up with their own clinical diagnosis, and we try to come up with We show them our pathologic diagnosis, and hopefully the two correlate. The purpose of this is to move us closer to being able to diagnose the CTE during life. Um, and figuring out the specific symptoms associated with it. You know, this is the biggest brain bank in the world by far that is interested in traumatic injury to the nervous system. We're getting more and more women's brains. Uh, traditionally, we've gotten very few, but we're now starting to see some women cheerleaders, soccer players, cyclists in their